now, and this has been a very busy and emotional few weeks for the NYPD. So we're joined this morning by NYPD Chief of Patrol John Shell and Commissioner of Public Information Tariq Shepard. So good morning to both of you. Thank morning, you for being here. And there is a lot to talk about. And I want to begin by expressing, of course, our sympathy here at PIX11 for the loss of Officer, Officer Jonathan Diller. And, and Chief Shell, I want to begin with you here because he was part of the unit that you helped begin. This is a specialized unit here. So when you look at a loss like this, not only for the family, but the department, where do you go from here and, and what are the next steps? Well, it hurts us all. It hurts our city. You know, we're still in mourning. Uh, we feel for his family, a uh, tragic loss. And just what he was doing that day, he was in doing some transit work that morning, went back on the streets and confronted two individuals that quite frankly shouldn't have been on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, and he lost his life for it. But, you know, Hurt, hurt, mortally wounded, he still fought. He still fought to the end, and he threw that gun uh, away from uh, the perpetrator, possibly saving the sergeant's life. So just a terrible incident. Mm -hmm. We mourn, and, and we're going to work harder in his memory. You know, and Tariq, there's a lot of talk now about traffic stops altogether, right? There's no such thing as a routine traffic stop. There's always a danger when you're approaching a vehicle. Is the NYPD looking at, at traffic stops and how to approach them? Yeah, we always have to revisit our training, and that's something that we've been having conversations about. Uh, that includes tactics and taking a hard look at making sure that our officers have the most up-to-date information and that they're getting the amount of hours that they need. And so, um, obviously, we spent the last week dealing with a lot of grief mm -hmm. and, and mourning the loss. But now we got to make sure that the loss of this officer, Officer Dilla, is not in vain, and we improve our department so we can save all the cops lives all right i want to talk about some of the news of the day that's happening this morning and one of the big stories that we're closely following came out of the bronx eight migrants arrested living in the basement of a home a basement where there were guns found there were drugs found and there were children inside that home so chief shell first off what led to that home the landlord saying he had no idea there were eight people in the basement what brought you there in the first place well it was a, it was a call 911 call for a person with a firearm our 5-2 uh, priests and personnel show up, mm -hmm. and we quickly engage one person with, with a gun, chase him into a basement apartment. In that basement apartment, we engage a second male with a second gun. Uh, we extract them, make the arrest, and then we do a search warrant on, on the location. Mm -hmm. And we find two additional guns, one being a ghost gun. We find ketamine narcotics, which is used to enhance narcotics. Uh, the landlord says they've been squatting there. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, these are also migrants. So. Why are our cops there a second time arresting people that one had an open gun indictment walking the streets, one had an open attempted murder shooting in Yonkers? So this is the problem. Recently. Recently. So the problem is we've already made these arrests. Now our cops are out there on the week of Officer Dilla's death, Detective Dilla's death now, confronting evil a second time. They shouldn't be in that position. We have to have a discussion as to why they were out of jail. But this situation touches a lot of topics I just mentioned. I've heard you talk about this before, right? Recidivism being one of them. When you're calling out folks to say the, the conversation needs to change, who are you t looking at? What are the names of the folks you'd like to bring to the table and have a conversation with? If the process works, the process works well. So who's in charge of the process? The stakeholders. Myself, the police department, our police commissioner, our district attorneys, our judges, our elected officials. We have to get together and see how we could do things better. And like I said, when the process works, the process works well. But sometimes it breaks down. What is that breakdown and how are we going to fix it? In this case, Tariq, how many were known to police before? Um, that, I think at least two um, that, that we had made prior arrest on. And just to follow up on what Chief Shell uh, just said, I think the recidivism issue is more about us thinking about victims. Okay. Uh, that's really us being victim-centric. And uh, recidivism is about the victims. Yeah, I mean, if you talk to folks on the streets of New York, they don't feel safe. Subway safety, of course, comes to mind. And I know year to year the numbers in the subways are down, but people just do not feel safe. We have people being punched randomly on the sidewalks. There was the, uh, obviously the two cases in Central Park just yesterday that were completely random, right? What are you doing about this perception that the city you can talk about numbers that people just do not feel safe. Right, the numbers are the numbers, right? right. The perception piece, the uh, community wants to see more cops, more cops in places that transit, for instance. But it's a delicate balance, right? To put more cops in the subway may make people say, well, now the subway's not safe because I see more police. Well, we have to be strategic in where we put our cops. So you mentioned Central Park. We're going to put more cops in Central Park. 
transit, of course, we, we've surged uh, cops also down there. Uh, the mentally ill and homeless. We're going to take a new look at what we're doing collectively with homeless and mentally ill people, whether it be transit or above ground. What can we do better? What can the interagencies do better? We're doing a lot, but what we can do better? We always got to be looking. Because you can remove folks from the subway that are mentally ill, right? The mayor had talked about that. Right. But what happens after they're removed? Well, that, that, that part of it is something that we're concerned about. Um, we, we don't have the psychiatric wards that we had in the past for many reasons. Um, but we have to come up with a solution that once we remove people, they can't just bring themselves back on, on the street. And even the removal or the visit to the hospital doesn't ensure that they're going to take their meds. Mm -hmm. um, the other part about the perception piece, Dan, is that this is why we come here. This is why we do television. This is why we do uh, interviews. This is why we go yeah. out and, and, and do our social media because we need people to know the efforts that we're making to keep the transit. So you brought up social media. I want to go there for a second because Chief Shelley, you've been very active on social media lately. The subway crime aspect was obviously a big part of this op-ed over the weekend in the Daily News, which touched off this bit of a Twitter tirade between the author of that article and members of the NYPD. You have called that anti-police rhetoric. You said it was anti-police. You also engaged in some name-calling uh, with the author of that article. Do you think that's the best approach when dealing with something like this? Well, sometimes that tone has to be set with the person he's speaking to. Name-calling? I, I and we are not going to sit by, on a, uh, especially in a week when we lost one of our members, to have a radio uh, personality dismiss that death. We're not going to sit by on Easter Sunday to have an, an op-ed piece come out the day after the death of one, a funeral of one of our members and then to double down on stupid with wrong facts. We're not going to sit by and let this happen. This is a two-way street. Okay, when I, when I make a mistake, I get called out for it. I'll, I'll take the loss. I'll own it. But we can't allow this. We, we won't allow it. But what about just addressing it with the author of that article and saying, hey, can we make the change, not doing it in such a public forum with name calling and so on and so forth? Yeah, then Is I, it adding to the hysterics of what's going on actually on the streets? I, I think that uh, John said it best, which is it is a two-way street. And we are open to conversations about crime and the way that our cops and, and, and our department And being held handles, accountable. And, and being held accountable all of, the, all of the time. But I think that two-way street means when you put wrong information intentionally or you just don't have a vetting process before you put up that there were 10 homicides in, in, in transit or you take a cheap shot at, our, at one of our members mm -hmm. or you intentionally post something to be insensitive on a, on a day of our uh, loss of one of our officers and his funeral and so his family sees that. I think the tone has to be different there than just having an academic conversation yeah. about crime. Okay. Um, there's, there's totally different, and I think you have to adjust to who you're speaking to. And, um, you know, when it comes to name-calling, I think we've been very reserved when it comes to that. However, uh, when it's appropriate and it fits, own it. All right. All right. Who, who, who made these rules about who could push back? Okay, I, I'm not going to sit by. Our cops are working so hard, so hard to get this city where it should be. And I'm not going to let misinformation and anti-police rhetoric by anti uh, journalists to cloud that noise. All right, we're going to leave it there. Appreciate your time, Chief Shell. Yeah. Great to Thank see you. you both, all right?